Hey guys, welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called Tutor by Academy Games. Tutor plays from two to four players and it takes about an hour, hour and a half to play. And in the game Tutor, you're playing as royalty. And basically what you're trying to do is gather rings on thine hand. If you can gather a bunch of rings, you're gonna get superpowers and they're listed on the back here. So gathering rings is very, very important in the game. Uh, additionally, it's got a worker placement vibe. What you're doing is you're placing down your uh, your plebs to make them go into the table, then you're placing your inquisitor down or your, your big dude, and basically taking actions based on how you place that guy. There's this courtroom that you need to go across in order to gain certain positions on the board, which will let you gain rings, which will let you gain points. If you gain the most points at the end of the last round of the game, you're going to be the winner. There's quite a lot of stuff going on in this game, but I'll show you it all, and then I'll also explain a little bit of how to play, and then my review. Let's take it down to show you Tutor, a really fascinating and beautiful game. So here we have the game Tutor by Academy Games. And as you can see, it is a game of royalty. And in fact, you're going to be getting hands that have rings on them. Uh, basically, all the stuff here is what is included in the game. This is the full retail copy of the game. This is the red, blue, the yellow, and the black player. Everybody's going to get their own specific color, as well as they're going to get their basic meeples and then their big high chancellor meeple. These guys will be placed on these chairs and these ones, and this guy will be placed on this chair over here. Everybody's also gonna get a score marker over here starting at zero and it goes all the way around the board to 100, but it might go even farther. There's a starting player marker that begins the game and you can go ahead and start with this. Uh, whoever starts the game is gonna get this marker here. And these are the tokens in the game that give you special abilities. There's cards over here of all the different types. You don't shuffle them or anything. They're just simply colored cards that you'll be using in the game to move your characters around the board. There's also additionally these little uh, square cardboard tokens that are used on these little areas here based on the number of players in the game is how it's set up uh, and what you do is you randomly take these guys here the, these two different colors the white and the black not this one here this is actually a double-sided one for a special specific type of game but you're going to shuffle them up and deal them out based on the game that it tells you to build this is for a two-player setup and then you're going to take all the little square tokens these guys here take out as many as needed for the number of players in the game in a two-player game you take out four of each of the colors which is why i have these guys over here so i can actually go ahead and set these aside they will not be used Use for this specific game um, and then you're going to deal them out randomly on this board right on top of these little symbols here uh, these other players I won't be needing as well so we don't have to actually play with those either and also for setup it's going to be based on the number of players how many rings you use and a two-player game you simply get two sets so in this case we actually won't get these rings either uh, then you're going to go ahead and choose one of each of the three different colored cards the blue the green and the red and based on what you choose is the game setup this is for the basic game setup. You're going to be using these three cards here. This one specifically explains how these tokens are used, the ones on the bottom, the circular ones. And then up here tells you the victory points you get for going up on here as long as, as, long, as long as collecting rings. And then up here will tell you how much these guys are worth at the end of the game. Now, depending on which one you choose, because there's quite a few of these different types of colored cards, will depend on the type of game you're playing. And you could also choose to play with more than one to increase the amount of scoring and or skill and strategy. Uh, the last couple little bits of knowledge you need to know is that these are your player reference cards. They explain how the turns work. And then this here is the round marker that goes all the way up here. Once it's 1543, that is the last round of the game. And that's pretty much the setup. The rest of the stuff you're not going to need. And you're going to begin by selecting two rings of your choice, along with selecting two of the same colored cards. So in this instance here, maybe this player is going to want a uh, brown and a silver and they're going to actually take a brown and a silver card and then the next player might select maybe a blue and maybe uh, let's say a silver as well so in this case I'll take these two here and that player will get a blue and a silver card as well and then that is pretty much the setup this tells you how many things you're going to be placing down per round and uh, that basically is the ready readiness of the game so let's go ahead and explain how it works. Now, without going into too much detail on all the turns and all that, because there's quite a lot in the game, uh, every player is going to organize their hand. And when you organize your hand, you're actually going to place your rings on your little hand. So in this instance here, uh, these little bars here indicate where you need rings in order to gain these special abilities. So if I placed a ring on this finger here, 
and a ring on this finger here, that symbolizes I have these two areas, which means I have the special benefit of D, making D's ability even more powerful. Additionally, I'll be getting the cards that correspond with it. And then on this character over here, let's say maybe I don't want D as much as I want B, so I'll put these rings over here, and then that means I'm gonna get D, B's special ability. You can go ahead and set these aside to, in your player area, and of course, you're gonna be hiding stuff, so this actually becomes a hidden player board, which uh, shows you and everybody else the rings that each player has. So we'll go ahead and set these aside for now, and I will show you how the turns go. And these guys don't like to stand up all that well, but we'll work with what we got, right? Uh, you're also going to be hiding the cards, so you're not going to show anybody your cards. Okay, so that is pretty much it. Now you're going to begin the game by based on the number of players uh, and what the, the game says, is how many of these tokens and characters you'll be utilizing. To start the game off, every player is going to be placing down meeples in these chairs here. So for instance, this meeple player might play here, and the next turn this player might go, oh, I don't know, here. This player might then go here, and then this player might then go here. After everybody has done that, these guys are actually going to move up onto the chairs here, just like that. Finally, each player will then be able to place one of their dudes uh, on any of these chairs here. So for instance, the blue player might play here and the red player might play here. Now why that's important is not only do you get both A and B ability or D and C or F and E, but if you do not have a character in this specific area, on the board, the other characters over here do not activate. So if blue placed over here, these guys would not get to activate this turn and instead would take some kind of action over here depending on the number of players who are taking turns in the game. After that happens, players are gonna go in turn order utilizing their characters and the, char and the abilities on the board. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight abilities that they can go ahead and utilize. And it tells you how they work. So let's go ahead and explain all the actions in the game. This one over here says you can move one space up, down, left, or right based on the color ring you have on the board. So for instance, if I wanted to move, uh, let's say that I had a, uh, a silver ring here, I could make this guy go down. I could take this character here and place it here. That's because I'm moving up. I have silver as my ring color. I would then get to take anything I, I walk through. I would always take these guys here. And whatever I land on means I'm gonna actually take the little circle as well. So in this case, I get this circle and this silver. If I had walked two spaces, I would actually not get to take this. I would in fact take the bottom one here and the top one here, but I'd have to leave that, but I could still take this one. This will always let you take it as long as you walk over it. So that's just basically how movement works as far as going around the board. Um, and how that functions. Now, what's also interesting is that these guys at the end of the game will score you points, and it tells you up here what they score. If you have one, it's one point, two of the same type, it's three, three, it's six, so on and so forth. So having a lot of the same type in this specific game mode will give you a lot of points at the end of the game. These guys here have special abilities. This one specifically will let you switch between units, swapping them around like this, and that will be important. I'll show you why later. And the other one, the white one, will let you go ahead and draw any of these cards that you want. But remember, they're also worth victory points at the end of the game collectively based on the number you have compared to everybody else. So maybe you actually do not want to spend them. Maybe you want to save them. And so that signifies that this player has gone. Then the next player is going to get to go, and the red player can choose this one, this one, or this one. If they choose one of their characters over here or here, they can choose either of their abilities, but not both. If they choose one on this side over here, they can select both of the abilities and they can select them in any order that they want. So now I already showed you movement. This one over here says you can switch a ring of one type for another and take a card of that color. So if I wanted to, if Red wanted to, he could move this down here and then he can go ahead and swap. Maybe he doesn't want this, this uh, silver ring after all. He can swap the silver ring and he can put it back and he can instead take a blue ring. So he put it over here on his hand and uh, then after that, that would be his turn. He'd be done. He'd also take a card that is blue. So then it would go ahead and be the next player's turn. So he can go ahead and select C or D. And C will allow you to discard one or two cards and move one or two spaces based on the cards you discarded. So for instance, if I wanted to, I could discard one blue card and I can use one of my meeples to move up on one of the spaces uh, blue. So and this can only go forward, whereas this one can go up, down, left, or right. He would stop there, so he would take these tokens here and hide it behind his board. Uh, and that's how C works. Now D is, if you want, you can take one card of two different ring colors. So for instance, I can take a blue and I can take a brown ring card, and that would be how D works. 
Now, A and B and C and D work the same way. So if I did that, I would get to use both of these abilities. And if I did this, I get to use both of these, in which case everybody would have acted and everybody is done. The other action spaces are over here. This one is just a larger variant of this one. And this one is just drawing a card of your choice. And let's say that people are still going. So it has three rounds of play and you only got two rounds, but you don't have any guys to utilize because let's say for instance, that it look something like this, in which case uh, blue we get to take so yeah, maybe look like this. Blue would get to take actually three actions, whereas red will only get to take one. That means that the other two actions red can choose to take from over here, which is the G and the H. The G says you can simply discard a card and move one space up. So it's basically the, the, the crappier version of this one. And then H says that you can go ahead and uh, take a colored uh, card based on a ring that you have. And that is pretty much all the different movements you're gonna be taking. After that happens, these guys will actually stay on the board. So in this instance, let's go ahead and just leave these guys here in some way. Everybody's off. And I'll show you how it kind of works. So the next round, players are actually gonna take another meeple and place it, and then they're gonna put it in an area. And eventually these guys will knock the players off. So these guys, are, as more and more come on, these will knock off. So that's kind of how these guys work. And like I said, remember that this guy here is vital to making sure you can use these guys' actions. Also, these guys will reset. So you'll be able to utilize the abilities once again. Now, how does movement work over here? So that'd be one round. So this would go over here. And after all of these are over, that'd be the end of the game and you're gonna do the end scoring. But let's talk about the board over here. So as I said before, as you walk across these areas here, you're gonna be able to take these guys up until the point where you stop. And then you're gonna be able to take these as well. Uh, also to note, when you do that, you're going to afterwards refill the board. And there's a bag here that will let you refill the board uh, with these little tokens here. You're never going to refill the circles, just these little tokens here. So as you move up on the board, you're going to fill in the spaces with the little squares indicating that you've moved off to them so that other people can take them, which means the board's always going to be ever changing. Another thing to note is you can always go left, up, down, or right, as long as you have the ability to move that way, provided it also says so you can do it on the board. Some of them won't let you do that because eventually you'll get to a specific spot, like this one over here, that will let you push yourself up. It's a free movement upwards, and it'll let you get a new ring. So you can then choose a new ring, getting you new powers, and also getting you victory points based on the game's conditions. There is one, two, three, four, five spaces here. Additionally, you can never usurp yourself. So you can never have a character here and push yourself off to gain points. You always have to have in different areas. But another player can be here and push you off, thusly taking away one of your rings and gaining the points. So you have to be very careful as to how players are moving up this board here. And you're gonna be leaving your guys there as long as they are that specific thing, whether they're the High Lord Treasurer or maybe the Archbishop of Canterbury. These are specific like prestigious positions of power and you're trying to get all your guys up here to gain as many rings. You can have as, ma as many as five or more rings, but you can also lose all of your rings as well. Whenever you gain or lose a ring, you can always reorganize your hand, as well as whenever you exchange a ring, you can take one off and place it on your hand as well. Well, thusly giving you specific new abilities. Uh, on here it tells you if you have the A power, it'll let you move anywhere one space. If you got the B, it's gonna let you uh, do uh, two rings, which will trade two rings for two other rings and get a card. And they all have specific extra bonuses that kind of give you a little bit of an extra, a little extra advantage in the game. But that's pretty much the idea of the game. You're going across this board with these guys, taking these tokens here, hoping to get as many of the same colors you can, depending on the game mode, of course. Deciding whether to use these tokens or not, gaining victory points for getting up here, as well as the rings, and uh, trying to do your best to manage your actions over here in this worker placement uh, movement style game. Anyway, that is the basic idea of the game Tutor. Let's come up and I'll tell you what I think about it. So let's talk about Tudor and what we thought about it. Well, first of all, this is kind of an interesting review, I suppose, because the game is great. I really, really enjoyed this game. This is a solid worker placement. Moving the characters up on the board to gather the rings is a lot of fun. There's a little bit of aggressive aspects to this game and the nature of you can take rings from other people and push them off and they lose bonuses, but that's all well and fine, provided you're aware of the situation and how it's gonna be functioning before you go into it. Uh, there are certain spaces on the board you're likely to use more than others 
others to begin the game with, but that slowly changes over time. For instance, A, B, C, and D are spaces that you're constantly using, whereas E and F are less likely to be used. But when E is used, it is going to be a big game-changing moment because players are playing one to seven cards to go all the way across the board. You're not prepared for it because you're not ready because you don't know what they've got, unless you've got a really, really good memory. The game scores pretty well. It starts off a little slow as far as scoring goes, and then it pushes pretty fast up to the point where it can be even ridiculous as far as the things you can get in the game, but that is all fun, fun, fun. The artwork is very, very, very good. It is wonderful. The thematic aspect of the game, putting the rings on the fingers is excellent. The rings themselves are nice quality, and in fact, if I really wanted to, I could probably even wear one of these rings. <sighs> Oh, now I have the feelings of grandeur. It is a really nice little um, component quality as far as that goes. Even the little ring stand, everything fits back in the box very, very nicely. There's a ton of replayability because there's all the different types of cards, the blue, green, and red cards, which allow you to play the games in different ways, as well as adding multiples of them to make the game even more... Uh, more complex in strategy. The game itself is pretty easy to learn, but very, very difficult to master, and there's a lot of thought in this game. If you're somebody who has a lot of analysis paralysis, this may not be for you. But if you like deep worker placements, if you like the feeling of moving after placing and controlling your actions, gaining new actions based on your rings and the special bonuses, this is this is fun. I really, really enjoyed this game. Uh, in a two-player game, it is probably less fun than in a three and a four-player game, which probably goes for most worker placements. I would say that the sweet spot in this game is three or four players, but I did enjoy myself in a two-player game as well. Two nitpicks for this game, and they're not very big, but one, one irritated me quite a bit. Uh, the first one is on the board where you have these little heist counselor dudes, the little ones that look like uh, bishops, I guess, from chess, you place them on the chairs, and then when you use their action, you move them off onto the circle. The problem with that is when I visualize placing my dude, I always visualize placing it on the circle because it matches, whereas the chair is more of like a little square platform, so it doesn't feel like it's supposed to go there to begin with. The other little guys aren't so bad when I place the chairs, but uh, they still can have that problem. So you're like, oh, did I place this guy in the back or did I actually use the action? I don't remember. So it has that weird, like, I don't remember if I'm supposed to place it there or not. I know it's a small nitpick, but it drove me nuts throughout the game because we couldn't figure out sometimes if we used an action or not. The other thing, which was more of an irritation for me, was that these little boards here, are supposed to be stand-up table things on them. Luckily, they stood up throughout the entire review, which was pretty impressive, or mostly, I think one kind of fell. But for some reason, mine did not like to stand. Uh, I think that, I mean, throughout the entire game was an irritation. I tried to figure out ways to do it, putting little things in. If they would have included just a little piece of plastic to kind of put in between, like an L-shaped plastic, you could fit in these things so they sat just like that. This would have been such a great experience with this hand thing. I love placing the rings on there. It felt good taking my actions and doing things with this board here. It just was really irritating when it fell down over and over and over again. Ah! Otherwise, this is a solid game. If you like this type of game, I would strongly suggest taking a look at it. Academy Games did an excellent job choosing this designer to make this wonderful, wonderful game. Tudor gets my seal of approval! Except for the damn hand!